Happy Halloween! Yeah, yeah, yeah. What a day, man. I can't believe it got cold all of a sudden. Hey, grab a Bible and device. And we actually have a lot of reading today. We're going to be camping in a uh, parable of Jesus. And so turn to Matthew chapter 13. And when I say we have a lot of reading, we have a lot of reading. And uh, so it's going to be great and fun. We just are starting a new series today called Four Hearts. And uh, we just finished our spiritual growth campaign, which was chosen. And I, I just loved it so much, and it's very exciting. But people have asked, they said, hey, uh, do we still have life groups after this? I mean, yes, we continue throughout the whole year. So, so you go to your life group this week, and you're going to be studying Four Hearts. And so um, over the next couple of weeks, and then we have Thanksgiving and Christmas, and, and then we come back in in January. But also, uh, on the devotions, if you didn't finish your devotion, like I've still got a couple days left on, on mine, but some of you, you might have only done five days or you've done 20. Yeah, keep going on. Finish it. Even though the campaign's over, doesn't mean you got to stop doing your devotions. In fact, our whole idea was to teach all of us as a church, hey, devotions are good. Having this connection with God. Remember, the, the subtitle of that was, what if you allowed the gospel to re get into your heart every single day? Yes, so do that all the time. Uh, if you're looking for other devotions, you can always find ones online. You can go on Uversion. They always have a daily devotion. Every day they can pop up something on your Uversion uh, Bible app or just start reading the Bible and continue to be doing that as we have that as one of our uh, goals for this year. Well, today is trunk or treat. And we have it from 4 to 6 today out in our parking lot. And there's going to be games and all kinds of things. And it might be a little chilly, so wear your coats and outfits. I mean, we're kind of used to it in Colorado. I mean, there's sometimes it snows and sometimes it's hot. But either way, so we're doing it from 4 to 6 before it gets dark. And then kids can go out afterwards. But it's a big outreach event. Come, just have fun, even if you don't have a trunk. And you just want to bless people and say hi and hand out water bottles, do whatever. It's just a lot of fun. Um, okay, so uh, we don't really know, we know a lot more about our American Revolution over here, but you know, the French Revolution happened after ours, but very different than ours. And they actually had basically the nobility and all the kings and queens and the princes and nobles and all these people had so massive amount of wealth. And then there was everybody else. And they were as poor as poor can be. People were starving all over the place. And finally they had an uprising and to take over the nobility. And so that's where that phrase, off with their heads, came from. Because they had the guillotine. And man, they were just taking kings and queens and Marie Antoinette and all these different people and killing them all. But some of the nobility were able to escape. And they would, what they would do is they would dress up like a pauper or a peasant or something, and they would work their way across the borders. And some of them would pay people to hide them in a wagon. You know, you've seen all those different things. Well, uh, so a lot of them escaped. Not so much for this guy. And this is a true story. It was a Marquis de Condorcet. And uh, it's a famous story about Marquis de Condorcet. He, he uh, you know, gets his money and he dresses up as a pauper and, and a peasant. And he's working his way across the border of France. And he decides to stop at an inn and have a breakfast before he gets in there. And he sits down and he said, I would like an omelet. And the innkeeper said, how many eggs? And the Marquis said, a dozen eggs. A dozen egg omelet. In the middle of peasantry, so everybody in the room knew that this guy is not a peasant. No peasant could order a 12-egg omelet, the idiot. And so they beat him up, and they threw him in jail, and he ended up dying the next day. You see, it's really hard to hide who you actually truly are. You know, you can say you're one thing, but the reality of who you really are is going to come up to the, the top. And this is the case of even Christianity. And so the parable Jesus is going to talk to us about is that there's going to be different types of people. And even, even in America, you know, uh, what is it, 70 to 80% 70 to of all Americans say that they're Christians. You know, that they believe in God. But is that really true? I mean, lots of people can believe in God. I mean, it's pretty obvious he's out there. And lots of people can say, well, I was born American, so I guess I'm Christian. But does that really mean you have allowed the gospel to penetrate your heart? And does that really mean that just because you call yourself something that you actually are? No. Probably when it's all said and done, we're going to find out that it's more like 20, maybe 25% of all people are actually have a saving uh, understanding of a relationship with God. And so Jesus is going to tell a parable about this. And it's called the parable of the sower. 
And it's not about farming. It's not about knitting. It's about people's hearts. And so we're going to look at four different types of hearts over the next course of the four weeks. Today is a hardened heart. And that's the one we're going to look at. So let's begin this time in prayer. Lord God, thank you for the worship that we've already had. And we look forward to what's going to be for us as we worship a God who just does anything to reach your people. And so would you bless this time. We want to open up our hearts to you. And may your gospel, may your word penetrate it into the deep recesses. And may we be different today when we leave than the way we came in. We pray this in Jesus' name. Okay, you in Matthew chapter 13? Okay, as I said, there's going to be a lot of reading today. And uh, so if I get winded, you know, pray for me. I might take a break. Uh, but we're going to go all the way to verse 23. So we're going to start with verse 1. Uh, the same day Jesus went out of his house and he sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and he sat in it while, on the, while the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell on the path, and the birds came and they ate it, ate it up. Some fell on the rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let him hear. Now that's going to be a theme of what Jesus is talking about from here on out. That line right there. Whoever has ears, let him hear. So the disciples came to him and they asked, why do you speak to people in parables? Well, he replied, because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. I'll explain that later. Whoever has will be given more and they will have in abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has well, will be taken from him. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. In them is filled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's hearts has become callous. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they, they might actually see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are their, your eyes because they see, and your ears because they hear. He's speaking of the disciples. For truly, I tell you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Listen then to what the parable of the sower is all about. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, and he means understand, he means by uh, letting it sink into them, the evil one comes and he snatches away that which was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The seed falling on the rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. And the seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of his life and the deceitfulness and wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what is sown. Whew. Told you that was a long passage. A lot of reading. Okay. Let's break this down some, and we're going to start out with basically trying to answer the question that the disciples had in verse 10. They, they said, hey, why are you speaking to people in parables? Okay, so why is he doing that? But let's first go on to go, what is a parable? So a parable is, the word parable is two Greek words broken up, put together. So para and uh, bolo. So para Bolo are the two Greek words mean to throw alongside. That's what parable means, to throw alongside. What a parable really is, is it's taking a known truth and revealing an unknown truth. Something that's true but 
was not known from before. So in Jesus' case, he's giving a known truth about a farmer. Or maybe another parable might be a known truth about a shepherd. Or about a woman goes before a judge. Something that's known, that everybody understands. So take a known truth to reveal an unknown truth about the kingdom of God. Or about the Messiah. Or about uh, God himself. Does that make sense? So you take a known truth and an unknown truth and you throw them alongside each other. A parable. So that's what that means. See, you learn something every day uh, when you come to church. And so that's what that all about. So why did he speak in parables? Well, Jesus answers that himself, right? The disciple says, why do you speak in parables? And he says three reasons. The first one is this. In order to continue revealing truth to his disciples. So let's look at verse 11 and 12. So Jesus looks at them and he says this. He goes, he replied, uh, you know, why do you speak in parables? He replied, because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, speaking of the disciples, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. Okay, so he basically says this. He goes, I'm gonna reveal secrets. And he doesn't mean secrets like, you know, I've got a secret and I'm not going to tell you, nanny. You know, he's not talking about that. He's saying revealing the mysteries of the past. You know, that what, what was alluded to in the Old Testament about a Messiah coming. You know, the secrets of that, the mysteries of that are now going to be revealed to you. And he says, but some will want to hear it and others will not. And so the reason why I'm speaking in parables is so that those that want to hear the truth, can hear the truth. But those that don't want to hear it, it's hidden from them. And that's the second reason why he, he is speaking in parables. He basically is saying to hide the truth from those who would not believe. So again, let's look at verse 11 and 12. Why do you speak in parables, Jesus? He replied, because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more, and they will have in abundance Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. This is why I speak in parables. Let, let, me, let me break that down. The secrets of heaven, the re revelation of God, will be understood by those that want to understand it. And so he says, you disciples, and he's not, a lot of times when we think of the disciples, we think of just the twelve. We need to realize that there is many, there's hundreds. There's women, there's men. You know, yes, there's the 12. That's the inner circle. They had a different role. But when he talks about the disciples or disciples, he's talking about anybody who's following him. So right now he's talking to a group of people. And when they ask him, why are you speaking in parables? He says, because I'm going to speak in a language and I'm going to reveal extra things to you that want to know. So those that, that uh, have will have even more. But those that don't want to know the truth, it's hidden. You know, they don't want to know it. So I'm not going to throw my pearls before swine. And it's going to be hidden from them. Let's, let's look at it like this. Two skeptics. You have skeptic A. And the gospel comes to them. They hear the word of God. And they mock it. They toss it aside. They scoff at it. They laugh. They say, I'm not going to believe a bunch of hooey like that. Then you have skeptic B. Still a skeptic, but they hear the gospel, they hear the truth, and they receive it. And they get on their knees and they cry out before the Lord and they say, Who can save me from being such a wretched person I am? Thanks be to Jesus Christ. And they receive the gospel. Okay, now what's the difference between these two skeptics? They are both skeptics. The word was the same word. The love of God is the same love of God. Truth is still truth. What's the difference? It's the hearer. The gospel is the same. It's the receiver. One receives and scoffs. One receives and repents. You see that? And so Jesus says, I'm going to reveal to, to some and what they have, they will be given even more because they are attracted to it. Those that don't want it, then it's going to be taken away. And then he gives a third reason why he speaks in parables. He says to fulfill prophecy. That whole section about the hearers and the perceivers and they're not going to perceive or whatever is all from Isaiah chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. And, and basically what he's saying in there is those that want to know the truth will know the truth. Okay, let, let me give you an illustration. You remember in the, the 90s and the 2000, early 2000s, I know some of you are too young, but there was this what, what was called stereograms or those 3D art 
So you got that right up here. I got an example of it. You know, remember, you'd walk by and you have to, I don't, I don't know if you can stare at it on here, but you'd stare at this picture and all these little dots and lines. And then if you looked at it and kind of crossed your eyes a certain way, all of a sudden like a 3D picture starts to come out, like a tiger leaping out of a forest. Or, or maybe you'll stare at it and a, and a heart, 3D heart comes out. And I know some people could never, ever see. But what Jesus is saying is goes, those that want to see, We'll see. Those that want to gaze and look for the three-dimensional art will find it. But those that would want to just walk past it and go, ah, who cares? It's hidden from them. Does that make sense? Like, here's another one. Here's another picture. Like, where's Melissa? <laughs> where's Melissa? See, most people can't find her. But uh, no, she's right there. I'm just kidding. But, but, but honestly, that's basically what it is. If you just walk past this art and sit there go, I could care less. Even if everybody else is saying, this is truth. Look, look what you can see. I, I remember whole groups would sit there and go, oh, I can't see it. Just keep looking. Just take your time and you'll see. Jesus is really into, if you seek, you will find. He says it over and over. If you knock, the door will be. He didn't say the door might be. He goes, if you knock, the door will be open. So we need to understand something. God has made it clear, not just here, but everywhere in Scripture. If you want salvation, you will get it. If you want to know the truth, you will find it. You just need to gaze in there. And as the group is going around and going, oh, if you just look, and somebody goes, ah, who cares? And he says, that's why I speak in parables. So that those that want to know the truth will find it. And those that don't, well, then they have no excuse. So let's look at this parable of the sower, okay, why we're at it. Um, uh, the focus is not on the sower. Who's the sower? Who would you say the sower is? Really? Come on, shout out. Jesus. Okay, Jesus or God. God. God is sowing, and the seed is the word of God, or it's the gospel. Okay? So God or Jesus, same thing, um, is the sower going around and throwing seed. Okay? But the parable is not about the sower the parable is not about the gospel or the seed. The parable is about the soils. Okay? So there's four different types of soil. We had the first soil was a hardened path. And the seed comes on there and it doesn't penetrate. And the birds come in and they take it. Okay? The second soil was the one on rocky soil. It's got a little bit of dirt on top of this rock, but there's no ability for roots to get in there. And then the third one is the uh, uh, one that's uh, thorns and thistles are in there, and it's, it's just bad soil, and the thorns choke it up. And then the fourth soil is the good soil and the tilled soil, and it, it, it brings a, a, a return of 100-fold or 60-fold or 34. Four soils. Now these soils, Jesus tells us, represent hearts. Thus the title of our sermon series, Four Hearts. Okay? And so it's not about the sower necessarily. It's not about the seed. It's about the receptiveness of these different types of hearts. And so what's the lesson that Jesus wants? If you wanted to know what's the overall lesson, that, that God's gospel is going out to every man. Whether they have hard hearts or not, it's going out to them. And, and most will reject it. And some will receive it. That's the lesson of the, of the parable of the, the sower. Is that most will reject it and some will receive it. And what's the purpose of this particular parable? It's the same then as it is today. It's to ask, make you ask the question, what type of soil am I? That's it. The purpose is to ask yourself, what type of soil am I? Or what type of heart am I? So over these next four weeks, we're going to glean something from each of them. I mean, in a group like this, I mean, most of us do not have hard hearts. I mean, you're a church, you know. I mean, maybe somebody dragged you here or whatever. But most of us don't really have hard hearts. We're, we're at least wanting to desire to do that. But we'll still glean something off of each of these that will help, help each of us. Like this. You might not have a hard heart. You may have accepted the gospel and Jesus dwells within you. Absolutely. But are there areas in your life that you've hardened to God? Are there areas that you said, mm, that room you can't go into? Are there areas where we are not receptive truly to the inner workings of God? 
So there's always something we can glean out of these. So as we go through these each week, not only are we learning for ourselves, but we're learning for other people. So let's break it down. Four hearts. Today we're going to look at the hardened heart. Let's look at Jesus gives the interpretation. And so we're going to jump down to verse 18 and 19. He goes, listen then to what the parable of the sower actually means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, again, understand means allowing it to penetrate to them, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. So the picture is of a farmer or sower who's throwing his seed anywhere and everywhere, right? Seems kind of weird. Wouldn't a farmer just, just stick to the farmland? Nope, he's tossing it where weeds grow, where rocks are, even on the path. It is going to everywhere so that no one has an excuse. No one can get up to heaven and go, oh, I never, I never heard that, or no one ever told me. And he goes, oh, yeah, it was there. It has to do with your heart. The gospel went out, you know. So we got this picture of the sower doing all that. And the interpretation is that these path, this path is a heart that is hardened. So what does it mean to have a hard heart? And so in Scripture, you know, whenever we look at the heart, that is actually the emotional center of who we are. Uh, it's the decision place. So always when Jesus talks about the heart, it's the decision center of our life. Obviously our heart doesn't actually receive anything. It's our brain. But he's talking about an emotional decision center. So what does it mean to have a hardened heart or have a hard heart? When the Bible refers to a hardened heart, it means it's stiff, it's unmoldable, it's unshapeable, it's unpenetrable. That's what the scripture means when you have a hardened heart. Let's look at it like this. Let's say the great sculptor of the sky, God himself, and he wants to, and he has a a, a bunch of clay, and he's going to sculpt this clay into his image. And like any good sculptor, he's all excited about this. He's going to create this great uh, image in his own image. He lifts off the, the little towel off of that, and he notices it's as hard as a rock. Nothing. He, he hits it. It's just hard as a rock. So what does he do? He takes water, the water of life, and he pours it over that and starts to try to knead it and work it. But sometimes it works. But in this case, it's still too hard. That even with the water of life, it just runs off of it. And so he sets it aside. And then he picks up some clay that he can mold and shape into his image. Make sense? So what Jesus is telling us is that this this path, this heart, is so hard that the gospel can't even penetrate into it. The seed, the gospel can't even do it. And did you notice that it says the birds came and snatched it. Now the birds in this case, he calls them the evil one. So Satan himself. But now get this. Understand this. Everybody look at me. It it isn't that Satan snatched the seed and therefore the person's heart became hard. The person's heart was hard and therefore the Satan was able to snatch the seed. You see the difference? That's why Jesus said those who have will be given more. Those that do not have, it will be taken away. He's literally just saying if they don't want it, they're so hard. Here's the difference. On versus in. The seed, the gospel, was on the heart, not in the heart. See, people can come to church, and they might even hear the gospel and and actually kind of like it. Go, that's kind of cool. Yeah, that's good stuff. But it only stayed on the surface. It only was on the heart. It didn't penetrate into the heart. And therefore, since it's just there, Satan can snatch it away. And, and, And that's that. And that's the difference. So here's my question for you. Where are you? Only letting the gospel penetrate a portion of your heart. Because don't you want it to be completely in? God wants it to capture not just the surfacey relationship, but deep down to penetrate and make a difference into who you are completely. That's what we need to be doing. That's what we need to understand. Let the word of God not just be, I mean, even though I'm not saying that we have hard hearts, But I go, if we could take a lesson, is I want to make sure, Lord God, that I have opened my heart and I've opened my eyes and I have eyes to see and ears to hear what you have to say to me. I want the gospel to penetrate me. So in closing, um, I expect everybody, most everybody here, 
does not have a hardened heart. The next three weeks, we're going to be looking at these other types of heart. And you might see yourself in there. Because remember, what's the purpose of this parable? Is for us to ask the question, which heart am I? Which, which soil am I? And we will glean something from every single week. But I need to understand that, I mean, we need to understand that though most of us, probably all of us here do not have hardened hearts, but we all know somebody who does. We, we know people that have hard hearts. And honestly, some people that we think have hard hearts actually could be receptive to the gospel. I mean, we are supposed to, just like the great sower, throw the seed of the gospel everywhere. See, now Jesus is doing that work through you and me. We are to share our faith, and we are to do that. And I know there's people that seem like they're far from God, but maybe they're so close. They just need the seed to be landing there. Let's take me, for instance. You know, um, I didn't grow up in a church. Most of you guys know my testimony. I didn't grow up in a church at all, never set foot into a church until the week after I received Jesus Christ as my Savior. And, and when I came to Christ, I started, I started going to a young adult's Bible study. And in this young adult's Bible study, uh, uh, there, was, there was at least a third of the room. I mean, there's like 30, 40 people. A third of them, I went to high school. Some of them I actually grew up in grade school because I grew up in a small town in the mountains. And, and I was a drug dealer, and I was against Christians, and I used to cuss them out, and I get that, and I, I get all that different stuff. But, and, and this is me, I think it might have been like the third week of this Bible study. I've only been a Christian for three or four weeks. And I don't know what we were learning about, but I said this. I go, uh, I don't think there was a big judgmental in it. It was a real question. I just said, hey, if, if, if I'm thinking if all you guys know and believe that if I did not receive Jesus, I was going to hell. And I've known some of you since grade school. How come I had no idea that you were a Christian? How come none of you shared with me the gospel? The place was just quiet, kind of like how you guys are. And, and then one girl spoke up and she said, I don't know about everybody else, but I was afraid of you. <laughs> and if you think about it, I came across as a hard heart, right? Probably a lot of people said he's as lost as lost can be, right? But I was much more like that ground. You ever see that ground that's all kind of dry and rocky, but then you kind of rub your foot into it, and underneath is kind of a good soil? You know, or you can rake that up, and at the top layer it seems hard. Farmers have it all the time, you know, at the beginning of the season, but they just have to till it, and underneath this is good soil. So the reality is, that was me. I might have had this hard surface, but deep down inside, once the gospel came in, I received it awesomely, and I was on fire from day one. Oh, drugs? Nope, out of my life. Oh, sex before marriage? Out of my life. I, I completely took the gospel. What about your friends? What about your neighbors? What about your family members? You know, maybe your parents seem like they have a hard heart. All I know is this, is that t it was 10 years later that my mom finally received Jesus. And it wasn't until five years before my dad died that he received Jesus. But I kept sharing the gospel no matter what. I kept living it out. Because even though my dad seemed like he had a hard, hard heart, and I knew only Jesus could save him, it took 30 years. But he's in heaven, and I can't wait to see him. You know? And how do you know? that your neighbor, that your friend, that your parents, that your, your kids, that might seem like they have a hard heart now, but underneath, they're gonna go. So you're still supposed to plant a seed. You need to plant the seeds. For all you know, you're the one that plants it, and it's not until five years later that someone waters it, and now it grows. Make sense? So here's three applications, and, and I think these are important. Three applications for us as a church today based on this parable. The first one is this, is that we, like the sower, Jesus, Jesus is the sower, but now we have been commissioned to be that also. You know, right? We're representing him. We're ambassadors for Christ. And so us, just like the sower, we need to scatter that seed anywhere and everywhere. We just don't talk to church people. We just don't talk to the kind people. We share the gospel. Whether it's somebody at work, whether it's your neighbor. Have you ever thought that God planted you in your neighborhood for a reason? Have you ever realized that you're at the work that you're at for a reason? Heck, our lives don't mean anything unless we bear fruit. It's not about the job. 
It's not about the money. It's not about the school. It's not about the education. It's not about your neighborhood. It's about the people in your neighborhood. It's about the people in your school. It's about the people at your work. And we are to share the gospel and bring it no matter what the soil looks like. Because who knows? Maybe there's another Bruce Fosdick in there. Seems hard and scary at front, on front, but inside is just a little ishy gushy cutesy pie. <laughs> the second a- application is that we must also be aware that everyone, not e- sorry, not everyone will receive by faith. If we look at the parable of the sower, the majority reject it. That should not stop you from sharing the gospel. Understand right from the beginning, the majority out of 10 people, maybe two will receive it. Just keep going. Just keep sowing. You never know. But understand the majority will reject it. But you just need to keep keep on plugging along. And the third one is this, is that the evidence that someone has truly received Jesus is a crop or is a fruitful bounty. We know the difference between those that are truly a Christian and those that are not by our fruit. Remember, we learned last week that the fruit that lasts that Jesus wants is people. We need to pour into people's hearts. So today's Halloween. Trick or treat. Well, I'm going to tell you Jesus is all about treats. And he loves you. And he loves the people around you. And he wants you to bring the gospel. and Bring his glory into people's hearts. Most will reject it. Don't let that stop you from doing that which you were called to do. Amen? Amen. Well, again, I'm going to close in prayer, but I just want you to ask that question. Where am I not allowing the gospel to penetrate my heart? Maybe it's this area. Yeah, I'll let the gospel penetrate my heart when it has to do with me. Oh, but you want me to share my faith? Mm, not going let to let that happen. Where are you keeping God from making a transformation in your life. I know that's convicting as it should be, but let's pray. And I'm also gonna give an opportunity if you have not received Jesus to be able to do that today also. So let's pray. Uh, Lord, we just pray and ask that you would just bless this time as we think and contemplate you. We wanna be people that, that allow you to penetrate our heart in such a real way. So while your heads are bowed and eyes are closed, why don't you just take a moment right now just between you and God to talk to him with that question, where am I not allowing you, oh God, to penetrate my heart? Where am I not letting you be in? Just take this moment and pray. Lord, thank you that you're so wise and you love us. And thank you for pursuing us to the ends of the earth. And though some of us, man, it was tough to get us to finally believe. Thank you that you never gave up. And may we not do the same. May we be people that would, uh, may we do the same. May we be people that don't give up. Also, while heads are bowed and eyes are closed, if you haven't received Jesus and you'd like to do that, I want to give you a chance. And I'm not going to call you forward. I'm just going to pray for you right there in your seat. So if you're saying, today I want to receive Jesus as my Savior. I want, to, I want to be a Christian. I want to be a Christ follower. Today is my day. Could you just lift up your hand real quick? And I want to pray for you and say, today is my day of salvation. Okay, if you're afraid to lift up your hand, or maybe you're online, I'm still going to pray the prayer. And, and Oh, did somebody raise their hand? Okay, so we're going to pray this prayer. Just repeat this in your heart right after me. Jesus, come into my life. I believe and I receive you now. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. I now want to live for you. So I give you my life. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Everybody said? Amen. Let's give a hand, man. Salvation's good.